I'm doing part two of Who Touched Me? And my subtitle is Those Who Give of Themselves. Last week, we talked about those who take from us, and this week, we are looking at those who give of themselves. In part one, we focused on the woman who touched Jesus. We looked at the attitude she exercised, and yes, we commend her faith. She was a woman of faith, a very bold, audacious faith, but there was an aspect about her attitude that was wrong in, in the sense that she just wanted to take silently from Jesus without acknowledging the source of a blessing. And much as we may, we may be bold in, a, in receiving from God, we have to always have a thankful and grateful heart towards God. And not only towards God, towards the people that I bless into us. There are no silent receivers in the house of the Lord. Amen? But in this part too, we will be focusing on Jesus. And we'll look at those who give of themselves and, and those who help others. Uh, and sometimes people who are generous and give of themselves uh, get taken for granted. You know, uh, you're, you're kind, you're good, everybody likes you because when they touch you, they receive something. When they come to your house uh, or they have a conversation with you, they know that their lives will be better. And sometimes you can give and give and give and give until you become very dry. And so we're going to learn from Jesus Christ and we're going to look at how he responded to this woman and, and a couple of things that we're going to learn from the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at Luke's account of the incident. Luke chapter 8 and verse 43 to 47. Remember that last week we looked at Mark's account and we, looked for, we read from Mark chapter 5. But this time we're looking at Luke chapter 8. And the reason why I shifted from Mark to Luke is because there is a detail in Luke's account uh, that helps us to grasp the story from Jesus' perspective a little better. And it says, Now a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. Immediately, her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out of me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and fell down before him and declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. So this is a very interesting encounter between Jesus and, and this woman. I mean, this is the first time uh, the Bible is directly personalizing an incident of somebody touching Jesus and receiving healing. Most of the time, Jesus will be the one touching people, but this time, this woman comes and she takes the initiative and she takes a miracle from Jesus. And she does it without Jesus' permission, but she gets it anyway. Uh, and uh, she fully intends to go home uh, without telling anybody what has happened to her, uh, but Jesus caught her. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and then the story came out. I I'm glad Jesus caught her. Aren't you glad? Otherwise, we would never have known this story ever existed. We would never have heard this testimony. So when God does something for you, don't hide it. We must hear what God has done for you. It must be seen, it must be heard, so that others will be inspired by your faith. Don't be selfish in your breakthrough. So, let's consider uh, the statements that Jesus made. I'm just going to put up three of those statements. The first one is... Who touched me? Uh, Jesus said, who touched me? It was a qu question. Second one, Jesus says, somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. I know it. Because the disciples of Jesus were saying, Lord, how can you tell? He says, I know there is a somebody here who has made a withdrawal from me that they didn't deposit. 
So somebody touched me, and, and then the third statement Jesus made is that I perceive power going out of me. I perceive power going out of me. Uh, the tense is a perfect tense. Jesus said not only did he perceive it at that time uh, when the woman touched him, he was still perceiving it. So it happened at the time and was still happening because when the power is gone, it's gone. And so Jesus felt something had left him. So this woman's touch was not an innocent touch. It wasn't a simple touch. It wasn't something she should even have thought of getting away with it because her touch touched Jesus. And something about what she did had an impact on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to use this to just give us an idea of the pressing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because these statements reveal important aspects of Jesus' personality. You know, many times when we think about Jesus, we think, uh, uh, you know, he has no feeling, he, he has no uh, thoughts, he, he's just big out there, nothing touches him, nothing affects him. But Jesus shows from this uh, verse uh, some aspects of his personality. And there are three aspects of his personality I'm going to focus on. First is that Jesus had self-awareness. Jesus had self-awareness. He knew himself. If you're going to be a blessing to the world, you have to know yourself. You have to have self-awareness. And how did Jesus show his self-awareness? He knew who he was. Throughout the New Testament, we encounter Jesus in ways that show that he had a keen sense of who he was. He knew both of his divinity and his humanity. He was the son of God and the son of man. He knew who he was spiritually. He knew who he was naturally. He had a keen sense of who he was. And that's something uh, we also have to develop, a keen sense of who we are. And not only that, he knew the power that he had. Power is ability. It is the ability to get things done. And Jesus knew the power that he carried. You know, many times uh, uh, people have power and don't know they have power. You know, there are a lot of people who carry so much power and are not aware of the power they have. If, if for example, uh, you have somebody who has uh, a very strong grasp, you know, the, the, their forearm here, the muscles are hard, strong, and their bicep. And, and, and when they, sh you know, shake your hand, they squeeze your hand. Have you had people like that? They squeeze your hand, but they don't know they have that power. So what is going to happen is they're going to end up hurting people without knowing they are hurting people because they are not aware of the power they have. And it's dangerous to have power and not know you have it because you're going to mess up people's lives. And then there are people who don't have power and think they have power. So that's the opposite of it. Those who have it and don't know they have it, those who don't have it and think they have it, and they talk about how much power and influence they have, but it's zero. So those are two extremes. Jesus was none of those. He had power and he knew he had power. And if you're going to be a person who really is in charge of your life, you must know the power you have and understand how it works. Because if you don't, it's like a, a, a woman, the reason I'm talking about woman is first I talked about a man with heart. You know, a woman whose words are powerful. 
Uh, and, and if she's a wife, she doesn't even know her words are powerful, and she begins to exchange words with her husband and cannot grasp the impact of her words on her husband. Because a woman can destroy a man simply with words, not with a hard fist, but with words. The power of women is in a totally different dynamic. Words. So you have to know the power you have, self-awareness. Jesus knew who he was, and he knew the power he had. He knew what he was carrying. So all along as he's going around, he knows what he's carrying. That's the first thing we learn about Jesus. Second thing about Jesus is that he had situational awareness. Not just self-awareness, but situational awareness. He was aware of where he was at every time. Jesus' ministry took him to many different places and situations. He went to weddings, funerals, parties, religious services. He met all kinds of people. He met all kinds of people. But Jesus had situational awareness. At every point in time, he knew where he was. Because if you don't have situational awareness, you can go into places and behave wrongly. In the midst of a crowd, surrounded by people, Jesus did not become part of the crowd. Now, it is said, uh, uh, sociologists tell us that there is something called mob psychology. That when people are in a mob, they are in a group, they tend to be very bold. That's why people like uh, demonstrations. Because they mix up with the group and, and they, they, they're screaming. But when you isolate them, you find they don't have that courage. Because many people take their strength from a crowd. Jesus was in the midst of a crowd, but he didn't become a part of the crowd. He was aware of who he was. He was aware of where he was. He was aware of the situation he is in. And we must constantly develop not only self-awareness, but situational awareness. Jesus knew where he was, and he knew what was happening around him. He knew what was happening around him. You know, uh, each one of us behave differently based on situations we are in. For example, if I come to church and I sit in my chair and praise is going on, praises are going on, I praise with you. I lift up my hands and I show that I am worshiping God because I'm the pastor of the church. And I know in this situation, people are watching. Is pastor watch, uh, worshiping? Because, you know, if I come to church every Sunday and I'm just looking at it, <laughs> praise and worship is going on. Prayer is going on. Every time, then people are going to think praise and worship is not important. They're going to think, oh, when you come to church, just wait after the singing and wait for the preaching. But because I'm aware of the situation I'm in, I have to praise. Because my praise encourages you to praise. I have to come in early when praise and worship is going on. If I come in after praise and worship has gone on, you may think it's not important. But I have to show it's important. It's called situational awareness. Now, whilst I'm there praising and worshiping, most of you just praise and worship and that's all. But I am taking note of everything. I know the lights. I know when the wrong lights are on. I can tell when the sound has changed. I can tell when the bass has gone on in the sound. Sometimes I look back and they understand my body language that... Something is going wrong. It's called situational awareness. Now, most of you may be here and may not take note of anything happening in the service except what you are doing. But I must be aware of the situation. I must be aware of everything going on here. I must be aware of where the cameras are. 
Today, somebody was moving the camera up there, and I was watching him. I said, why is he doing that? It's called situational awareness. When I, when I was uh, young in, in primary school, we had a teacher. We thought he, she was supernatural, our class six teacher, because she'd be there marking the uh, books, you know, and then she'd say, Otabel, keep quiet. I would say, how did, how did she know Otabel is talking? <laughs> We thought she had extra power, but that is situational awareness. So while she's marking, her ears are tuned to everybody's voice, and she knows every child's voice, and she can tell that something is amiss here. That is how Jesus was when he was in a crowd. He didn't just follow the crowd. He didn't just move with the crowd. Jesus was aware there is a crowd, but he also knows amongst the crowd there are people. And people are doing things in the crowd. And I must sense what everybody is doing. So he had situational awareness. Now you can tell the big difference between Jesus and Peter. Peter says, everybody is touching you. In other words, all the touch is the same. All touch be touch. Jesus said, no, 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 no. Something is happening here, and I'm aware of it because I am at this moment present-minded. Somebody has touched me. Peter couldn't feel anything extraordinary, but Jesus could feel it. Do you have situational awareness? Do you tell the wrong story to the wrong crowd? Maybe you are sitting with people. Are you aware of the people who are there? Are you aware of everybody? Are you aware of people who carry stories from this place to the next place? So that the story you are telling now, are you aware that you are broadcasting it to the whole Ghana? Because many of us have no situational awareness. We get into a place, we, we just talk freely. And then later we say there are gossips in this world but who gave them the filler? (laughs) You were the one who gave them the filler. You had no situational awareness. You didn't know that this person sitting here, this story, they will multiply it 10 times by the time we leave here. So when you sit in your family gathering, know every cousin, know every brother, know every sister, and know their abilities and disabilities. Because if you don't do that and you are a generous person like Jesus who has so much to give, people will take advantage of you. Jesus had situational awareness. The third thing about Jesus is that he had spiritual awareness. He had spiritual awareness. He had self-awareness, situational, and spiritual. Jesus was aware of the impact he had on people. He was aware of the impact he had on people. Now, when it comes to spiritual awareness, I don't want you to become spooky here because there are people who have extra spiritual senses in a negative way. A cockroach is on the wall. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, please. Poor old cockroach. Oh, they are in the room and they see a wall gecko. It becomes a prayer meeting. <laughs> or they go out and, and they're buying food and they, and they say that, you know, this, the, the, I look at the woman selling the food, I believe that there are other things, so they have to have a full prayer meeting before they eat the wachi. That's not that spiritual awareness I'm talking about. That is extra. And then there are also some people who are on the opposite end who don't believe in anything spiritual. They walk through life as if there is no spiritual dimension to life. 
but there is a real spiritual dimension to life. Things happen that are spiritual. Jesus had a balance of both. He understood what was natural. He understood what was spiritual. But he had spiritual awareness. He knew the impact people he had on people. Jesus knew he had impact on people. He knew he carried healing. He knew that he could heal people. He knew that. But not only that, he also knew the impact that people had on him. People had impact on Jesus. Can you imagine this woman had impact on Jesus? She had impact on Jesus. You would say, oh, ah, this woman touched Jesus. Jesus wouldn't feel it. But Jesus felt it. And he said, I perceive that power has gone out of me. And you must be in a place where when people are draining you, you can sense it. When people are constantly draining you, they're taking advantage of your time, taking advantage of your money, taking advantage of your patience, taking advantage of your love, taking advantage of your generosity, and you just let them take advantage of you, then you don't know the impact people are having on you. There are some people that come into your presence, and when they touch you, you just feel discouraged. You just go to visit them at home. By the time you get to your home, you are depressed. Because every story they tell you is a depressing story. They drain you constantly. And there are certain people who make you paranoid. They are telling you about all kinds of enemies. Do you know that person? That person hates you. That one hates you. That one's plotting against you. Before you, by the time you leave their presence, you are so paranoid. They are not giving to you. They are draining from you. So in life, you have to know those who impart strength to you and those who take power out of you. And Jesus knew that. So he could tell, this woman is draining me. Because what is her benefit came out of me. For her, it is healing. For me, something has gone out. For her, it's a breakthrough. For me, something has gone out. And there are a lot of you like that. You are good-hearted people. You are generous people. You are kind. And people are just draining you. And because you have no self-awareness and situational awareness and spiritual awareness, you don't even know people are draining you. And listen to me, when people are draining you, they will drain you till you are dry. You are dry, gone. And then they, the same people, will say, ah, he used to have a lot, oh, now he doesn't have anything. <laughs> Human beings are nice people. <laughs> so Jesus had spiritual awareness. So what do we learn from this encounter about Jesus? That we have to maintain our internal power balance. Maintain your internal power balance. Sometimes you have to call time out. Some of you who go for meetings where everybody is asking you for money. You go somewhere and everybody is demanding your time because they know that you are generous with your time. At a certain point, when you start feeling drained and tired and weak, you have to learn to say no to people. I want to serve, but not now. I want to give, but not now. I want to help but not at this point, because I need to preserve my internal power balance. Otherwise, I'll be so drained, I can't survive. Because if you don't know how to do that, you're going to learn very shortly that you're always dry. When I became uh, a pastor, as a young pastor, I didn't understand these things. And when you're a pastor, one of the people that uh, people really drain from is a pastor. Because in our part of the world, the pastor is not just a spiritual leader. 
He doesn't have to come and teach only in the church. He's also a marriage counselor. He's a financial advisor. He's, 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 a, he's a contractor. He's everything. Somebody would rush to his pastor, very desperate, and the pastor said, what's wrong? He said, I chewed gum, and I swallowed it. You swallowed your chewing gum, you go to your pastor. Why didn't you go to the polyclinic? You know, because here, when somebody's sick, they call the pastor. The pastor is the first aid officer. He's the first, or she's the first, that people go to. So, my home, you know, and, and in my early days of, of pastoring, uh, I used to, we, I was living in a three-bedroom house, and uh, I lived in one room, another pastor lived in another room, another pastor lived in another room with their wives and children. And the boys' quarters was full of people. <laughs> Purchase. In those days, my wife used to get very, very upset because when there's food in the fridge and she thought that there's food in the fridge, next morning she goes and people have been led by the Spirit. <laughs> and, and much as it helped them fill their stomach, it was giving me marriage problems because my wife is upset. We can't keep food in the fridge. And, and, and these boys in the, in the house, they're always taking the food. I said, well, but you know, they are hungry. So at one point you are ministering to somebody, at another point it's creating tension for you. You have to know the balance. So people used to come, you know, people would come to the house early in the morning, in the night, every time. So at a point I said, listen, you have to come and see me in the office. Come to the church office and see me and book an appointment. And some people were upset. Pastor has now become very arrogant. We could go to him. He's now too proud. Who does he think? Did Jesus have appointment? Did Jesus have secretary? <laughs> you know, we don't know much about Jesus. But Jesus had appointments. If you wanted to see Jesus, read the Bible. They'll go and tell somebody, and somebody will tell somebody and say, somebody wants to see you. You don't just go and rush and see him. They went through uh, Philip or went through Andrew. Andrew was the PA of Jesus. But people were criticizing. Who do you, you know, it's, it's church. You are a pastor. But eventually people learned how to come to the church office before they see pastor. What was I doing? It's trying to manage your internal power balance. What you are giving out to help people is also draining you. And Jesus is teaching us what the woman calls her healing. It cost him something. It cost him something. And so he said, I perceive power going out of me. Listen to me. If power is going out of you, it's a good thing for the one receiving the power. But for you, something is going out of you. Virtue is going out of you. Now, a lot of you, virtue goes out of you, goes out of you all the time. And pretty soon, you are tired, you are frustrated, and some of you can let external pressure collapse your marriage. People who demand money from you, demand attention from you, begin to put pressure on your marriage. And before you realize, you and your husband are having problems. Or your children are having problems with you because you have no time for them. Because everybody can touch you and take something from you. And Jesus says, don't allow that to be so. Don't allow that to be so. Don't take yourself for granted. Don't take yourself for granted. Don't take yourself for granted. Because sometimes we take ourselves for granted. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's not anything. Oh, I can do it. Yes, you can do it. But you do it at the expense of something. You do it at somebody's expense. And it doesn't mean don't help people. But be aware. Especially if you have growing children and you have a lot of needs and you are helping people, you know, because in our society, people help people. All of us help people. You have cousins and nephews and nephews you haven't heard of, but you heard of last week, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all kinds of people. 
And sometimes the pressure is so much that you may find out your own children are deprived, your home is deprived, you are going through need. And if you don't manage that power balance well, you get drained. It is not for nothing that Jesus Christ spent a lot of time alone praying early in the morning because people were taking stuff from him. He had to go and get himself sorted out with the Father. Don't take yourself for granted and don't allow anyone to take you for granted. Help people. Be kind to people. Be generous to people. But don't allow people to put guilt on you. Be a good person. Be a good friend. Be a good neighbor. Be a good relative. Be a good uncle. Be a good aunt. Be good. Help people. But you have to maintain the balance. You have to maintain the right balance. Because if you don't maintain the right balance, people are going to draw so much from you and not even appreciate what you are giving to them. You give him something, they think you could have done better. You spend 10 minutes with them, they say you should have spent an hour. And they forget that in a day we have 24 hours, eight hours is spent sleeping. And in Ghana, about three hours is spent in traffic. <laughs> so by the time you settle down, you don't have much time left. And if you give somebody one hour of your time, it's a lot of your life you have given away. Once in a while you can do that. But there are times you find there's so many things you have to do and don't allow anybody to take you for granted. Free. Learn to tell people, I have five minutes and we'll talk for five minutes. And after that, say, it is nice seeing you. We'll meet again and move on. <laughs> will everybody be happy? No, but pretty soon people will understand you. And when they are coming to talk to you, they rehearse what they have to say in five minutes. They don't take you for granted. So for those of us who give of ourselves all the time, this is how we learn from Jesus how to manage the power we have so we don't lose everything and become weak for people to take advantage of us, draw us down to the ground, and sometimes just make us lose everything. And you don't need to seek approval from people by being good and kind and generous. Don't try to buy favor. Don't try to buy approval. You have to have self-awareness. You must be yourself so that you don't need other people to say he's a good man for you to feel you are good. You are good all by yourself. You are kind all by yourself. You are generous. You are a good person. You don't need to prove it. So from the two parts we've learned, there are those who take silently, no acknowledgement, but we also have to learn to manage what we have so that those who take silently don't weary us to the point where we become so dry we can't do any good again because we didn't know how to manage the power that we have. Amen.